Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Facts on the Ground. I'm Misty Winston and joined as always uh, by my co-host, Jesse Zerowell. Um, today, I am super excited to um, introduce our, our guest, who is an incredible independent journalist who has been living on the ground in Syria doing an amazing work. Um, uh, and I, she's one of my, I would say, top five favorite journalists. Um, so I'm very pleased um, that we have Vanessa Bealy on the show today. Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for inviting me. It's great thank to be you. on with you guys. Thank yeah, you. of course. We're um, super excited to have you. Um, there's much to discuss. Um, we could probably do like a six-hour show um, on everything that's going on in Syria right now. Um, but um, before we kind of dive into the current events of what's going on in Syria, I just wanted to kind of get your opinion and maybe what you have been hearing on the ground um, just surrounding uh, the Joe Biden win um, and, and what the people of Syria um, think about that in terms of their future. I think the best way for me to describe it is that uh, Syria under Trump had become um, an economic um, disaster zone. <laughs> um, you know, Trump very much backed off on the military engagement, um, but was heavily involved in the economic um, doubling down on sanctions and so on, and the increasing on sanctions, particularly towards the end of his presidency. What we've seen since um, Joe Biden was declared president-elect, of course, without going into the, um, the controversy over his election, um, what we've seen is an uptick in <clears throat> military aggression almost immediately, particularly from uh, ISIS, which, of course, Trump had, had bellowed from the rooftops, we've defeated ISIS, but of course they haven't. They were effectively re-incubating them, re-percolating them in, in Iraq, in their um, biggest uh, occupation base in Al-Tanif on the border with Jordan um, and Iraq. Um, ready for it. My view is it doesn't matter who the president is, the roadmap remains the same. And they each have, whether they were elected for that purpose or not, they each have a, a part to play in that roadmap. And as I pointed out, Trump was the economic sledgehammer. Biden now, in my view, will reignite the military aggression via the proxies like ISIS. As I said, we've seen um, a series of, of serious ISIS attacks, particularly in the Northeast, which of course is pretty much occupied by the US and the Kurds. So, this gives an indication that it is the US that's controlling ISIS. Biden himself in 2014, of course, admitted publicly that the US was behind the creation of ISIS. Uh, Kerry admitted in 2016 they allowed ISIS to flourish. You know, it, it's, it's, it kind of goes without saying that, the, that ISIS, in fact, all of the armed groups inside Syria are proxies of the US coalition. Um, and so, as I said, we've seen an uptick in the ISIS attacks, which of course gives, generates reason for the Biden administration to say, hey, we need more, more, more boots on the ground, we need military footprint inside Syria, and that's what we've seen. You know, this isn't conspiracy theory, we've seen uh, convoys of American vehicles entering the Northeast, setting up new bases, particularly in the oil-rich regions, to protect their, their Syrian resources, mm -hmm. their assets, let's say. Um, <clears throat> and we've seen also an increase in Israeli attacks, of course. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a number of attacks since New Year. So maybe we can talk about those for a bit because they mm -hmm. seem to be especially ramped up in the past several weeks. Can you yeah. detail what's been happening with regard to those uh, uh, bombings, which are illegal under international law? Yeah, I mean, I, one thing, of course, one trigger for them has been the Biden supposed reversal to the um, nuclear deal with Iran, right? Mm -hmm. And and we've seen the sparring between Iran and Israel, Israel threatening to preemptively strike Iran, <laughs> which, of course, is Israeli modus operandum, right? Let, let's hit people before they hit us and then call it self-defense. Um, and Iran actually coming back pretty hard and saying, OK, if, if you attack us, we're going to attack Haifa and Tel Aviv and so on. So this was going on around the time of Biden's inauguration. And Israel has made it very clear. I think last year they targeted around 500 sites in Syria. Right. Mm -hmm. 
this year they've made it really clear that the Iranian influence is what they're going to be targeting. Of course, this is just, you, you know, I, I kind of want to get people away from this war with Iran thing. I don't actually believe the US is going to go to war with Iran. They, I don't think they're that stupid. Right. Um, but what it means is it, it means targeting Iranian assets in Syria. So what it actually means is justifying an increase in military aggression against Syria. And that includes by Israel, mm -hmm. right? Because whenever Israel attacks, there was an attack uh, last week. And actually where I live in the suburbs of Damascus, it's always one of the first areas to be hit mm. because there's a couple of air bases to the south of me um, and uh, to the west of me. And there's a couple of research centers, there's a military base, etc. So this area generally always gets hit. So we always hear it first. Um, and they claim that they were attacking, um, again, Iranian positions. Of mm -hmm. course they weren't. They, they were attacking a Syrian air base. They did some collateral damage. The Syrian air defense systems, I have to say, people keep complaining and saying, well, why don't they have the S-400s and so on? But guys, these dudes do an amazing job. When, you, when you're hearing the incoming missile and you can go back to sleep <laughs> because basically they're bringing them all down, that's pretty, mm -hmm. you know, that's pretty amazing. And those air defense are maintained by engineers that basically update them in their spare time. <laughs> right? Right. This is Syria. You know, I've said this right from when I started coming here. When you look at the Syrian Arab army, and, and honestly, it breaks my heart, the amount of times I see these guys in mismatched shoes, in trainers in the middle of winter, Wellington boots, ancient guns, right? Ancient equipment. They're not receiving the state of the art equipment from the US and from its allies around the world. Compare the ISIS Humvees and their uniforms <laughs> to the Syrian Arab army. But these guys, when you drive around this country and you see the amount of territory they've taken back, it's astounding. It never ceases to astound me, actually. Mm -hmm. It is actually kind of amazing. Um, you know, yeah. the, it, it, Syrian people have been under, I mean, the, this war has been going on for, what, nine, ten years now? Um, which has done untold uh, damage to, um, you know, not just the country in general, but the population. I mean, Jesse and I were discussing before we called you that um, because of this war, like a certain uh, demographic of the Syrian people has been completely wiped out. Um, and then, you know, many people are fleeing like by the droves. Um, and so, you know, you have, um, you know, a Syrian army that is, you know, like you said, completely under equipped and underfunded and they, you know, their numbers are so small and they're still putting up this incredible fight against, you know, the world's largest empire and all its friends, um, which is, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty amazing to watch. Um, and yes, I understand that, you know, they have, you know, the help, the aid and help of Russia um, and, and Iran, and but it's still, it's really kind of um, uh, awe-inspiring to see the fight that they've managed to put up against the U.S. empire. Yeah, and I mean, they've taken huge losses and, and what a lot of people don't understand, it's a conscript army. There are some professional elements within the army, but the majority of those that are currently fighting are conscripts or volunteers in the National Defense Forces, for example, like many of the Christian towns in northern Hama, which is on the border with um, Al-Qaeda control Idlib. Um, the majority of those Christian towns were defended by volunteer uh, militaries, um, National Defense Forces. And for 10 years, they held off um, terrorist sieges in one town, al Skelbia, which is right on the border with Idlib. Um, I visited there many times during the, the siege of the town. Um, the nearest Nusra point, Nusra Front, which is Al-Qaeda in Syria, point was only 500 meters away. You could literally see the checkpoints <laughs> and you could see their, their kind of dig-ins and you could see the White Helmet Center, etc. Um, with the naked eye, you didn't have to get binoculars to, to see it. So, you know, hand-to-hand -hand fighting has been the format for 10 years. Hmm. So, yeah. 
with re- with incredible. regard to uh, Syria's provinces, where does <laughs> Islamic State and its affiliates still have a an anchor, so to speak? You mentioned Idlib. Yeah. Um, not so much in Edlib. Edlib is run pretty much by, by the, all the various rebrandings of Al Qaeda, Hayat Tabi Al Sham. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the latest one. So Edlib, which is the northwest, is effectively under the control of Al Qaeda. There are smaller splinter groups that that run underneath the control of Al Qaeda, and then of course above that is Turkey. Turkey, effectively, uh, both in the northwest and the northeast is using um, the extremist armed groups as um, chess pieces to move around. I mean, for instance, when they wanted to occupy areas of the northeast on the border with Turkey, ostensibly to protect themselves against Kurdish attack, they took uh, a free Syrian army, which of course were affiliated with Al-Qaeda, from the northwest and Idlib and took them over to the northeast. You pretty quickly saw journalists that had previously been calling them rebels. You saw them leaving pretty quickly at that point mm-hmm. when the head choppers actually arrived in the territory yeah. that they'd been embedded in under the protection of uh, Qasid, the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces that are also under the control of the US. ISIS, to come back to your question, ISIS are in um, the northeast, but actually the biggest concentration is probably around the U.S. Um, military base of Al-Tanaf on the border with Jordan and Iraq. Mm. Now, Tanaf is, is one of the biggest um, U.S. bases. There is a 55-kilometer exclusion zone around that base into which Syrian and Russian forces are not allowed to enter. A lot of people don't actually realize this. And in that actual exclusion zone, the U.S. is effectively training armed groups um, like Muwaya al-Thura, which is one of the sort of splinter groups of al-Qaeda, one of the extremist groups, um, using equipment such as HIMARS, which is high mobility artillery um, vehicles, which have, I think, a maximum range of around 300 kilometers. Mm. So these, you know, this is pretty sophisticated equipment that these armed groups are being given. And they're also being trained in the use of that equipment by the U.S. base there. In Rukban camp, which is what the U.S. called the refugee camp just to the south of al that is a recruitment and training ground for ISIS. So from that area, um, ISIS can basically fan out and attack areas like the Badia, the, the desert areas to the east of Homs and Palmyra. Now in the northeast, so in, in the far north, Um, The U.S. has basically been funneling ISIS fighters from Syria into Iraq. They've been training them, equipping them, and then sending them back into Syria. So if you like, from from both sides, from the north and from the southeast, America is controlling ISIS and sending it in um, to carry out swarming attacks, you know, terrorist cells attacking, leaving, attacking, leaving. So it's very hard for the Syrian army and even the Russians to keep surveillance on them. It's incredible to me that, um, and I don't think that a lot of people recognize this, um, the United States is there illegally. Um, and, you know, you're talking about these bases and then you can't, the Syrian people can't even enter <laughs> in um, to these zones. It's kind of incredible. And, you know, recently I just read an article um, uh, that, you know, we're now building a new airport in Syria. Um, and, you know, we're illegally occupying the country anyways, and now we're building more bases. Um, you know, can, can you talk a little bit about where the base is located that they're building now and what purpose it is going to serve? Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting because there was a report, I think it was in Middle East Monitor, about two weeks ago, saying that because, of course, Russia has had um, a base in Tartus on the Mediterranean coast of Syria for around 60 years now. That's a naval base, correct? Yeah, it's a naval base, but it's also obviously an air base. And they're extending um, the runway to enable the use of planes that are capable of carrying nuclear warheads. Now, this was put out uh, as a news piece Almost immediately, actually, the U.S. occupation forces vacated one base, which was relatively deep inside the Northeastern Territory, 
uh, at Al, I think it was Al Yarubia that they vacated, but I need to double check that. But they moved basically to an area called Al Malakia, which is in the furthest triangle uh, of borders between Syria, Turkey, and Iraq. And it's actually one of the most oil rich areas in the Northeast. The Northeast is oil rich anyway, which is obviously one of the reasons that the US has occupied it. That is typical MO for the US. Um, predominantly because they can use the oil as revenue for ISIS and then also for the PKK or the YPG or the SDF, whatever you know, Monica you want to give the Kurdish forces that are power multiplied by the US, guerrillas, mm -hmm. basically, conscious. Um, <clears throat> and you're right, I can't remember exactly where the airport is going to be, um, <clears throat> but it it's will be in, in that northeastern... Hasaka? Oh, Hasaka, okay. Yeah, Hasaka. Which is interesting because there's actually still a small um, Syrian Arab army base in Hasaka. Hmm. <laughs> Nobody actually knows this, but it's completely surrounded by the Kurdish militia. And of course, the Kurds in Hasaka have been basically um, taking over the barley and wheat and bread manufacturing sites. Um, they've been selling the barley and the wheat to, to Turkey via Iraq. And they've been withholding the bread from the civilians. And Turkey, on top of that, of course, has been, been withholding water. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that Turkey actually has control of most of the water in northern Syria, which then, of course, travels down through pretty much uh, as far as Damascus, I think, if I remember my map correctly. But Turkey has control over the dams on those water sources. So at any moment, they can cut off water supply, which, of course, is what they have been doing to Hasaka, to civilians in Hasaka, 1.2 million people without water um, at various times during the last kind of 12 months. Um, so, you know. And that and that smacks so much of uh, Israeli strategy with regard to the Palestinians as far as cutting off vital resources uh, to serve the ends of collective punishment. And um, I just wanted to dial back a bit and ask you about the the strikes that Israel has been carrying out. And just based on your uh, presence there on the ground, have you seen any sort of artillery fire or um, intended uh, ground to air strikes coming from the sites that uh, Israel has been bombing. Do you have any knowledge of that, or are they just not not that that would justify them bombing anyway? But I'm just curious if they if they have any sort of uh, aggression to respond to, or if it's again, you know, the Iranian boogeyman, the, the Russian boogeyman. Yeah, no, it wouldn't be there. <laughs> What's it's that? Definitely not the. What was that? Oh, sorry. No, I mean, it's definitely not the Russian boogeyman. Israel would never um, get involved in any kind of conflict with, with Russia, for sure. Um, it's definitely the Iranian boogeyman. Mm -hmm. um, sure, look, Israel consistently, what, what you need to understand, <clears throat> or you probably understand, but what people need to understand is Israel works in collaboration and in lockstep with the armed groups that Israel supports. You know, Israel has been very clear. It's given weapons, it's given um, uh, medical support, medical treatment to the armed groups, particularly in the South. Um, it's it even, has provided- it's even ferried a bunch of them out of the country. Yeah, the White Helmets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, but they're not Zionists at all, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. That's completely innocent that Israel should give them cups of tea and sandwiches on the bus to Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, don't, get me, don't get me on the way out. You're just feeling generous. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, even when the South was occupied by the various armed groups, of course, Israel would give covering fire for them if they were clashing with the Syrian Arab army. 
And even it would fire at the Syrian Arab army positions to try and provoke um, counterfire and then say that it had been attacked and it could attack the Syrian Arab army, right? Mm -hmm. Which again is, is typical Israeli tactics. Um, the areas that they tend to hit, so if, for example, um, we know at the moment that there's a very strong chance that the Syrian Arab army is going to restart the campaign in Idlib and try and take more territory. They've taken most of the territory below the road that goes from Aleppo to Latakia. It's difficult if you don't have a map. But effectively, it's, it's most of southern Idlib is under the control of the Syrian Arab army. Most of it was retaken in 2019-2020. Now we know that there is a push to, to take more territory and to head towards Idlib city. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we're seeing an increase in the breaks of the ceasefire by the terrorist groups. And we're seeing reports of a potential staged chemical attack, etc. Um, there's been around 35 um, ceasefire breaks by the armed groups, not by the Syrian Arab army, in uh, the coastal region and in southern Idlib. And, of course, at the same time, which, again, coincides with Biden's inauguration, and it also coincides with the uptick in um, Israeli attacks. So it's clear, as they say, as soon as you, you see the terrorists start to attack or start to, to revive themselves or refresh themselves, you see Israel getting bolder as well. And what it will do is to target the military bases, the research centers, so the military research centers, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the military bases and the air defense bases. Because what it wants to do is to reduce the Syrian capacity, um, military capacity, both from an ammunition standpoint, and if it can, of course, it will try to wipe out um, Syrian Air Force uh, equipment and planes so it can't fly, in theory, because that's basically what they did when they were liberating eastern Ghouta in um, 2018. It was consistently bombing Meze Air Base, which is close to eastern Ghouta, and it was from there that the Syrian army helicopters and planes were flying <coughs> um, as part of the operations to liberate uh, the eastern suburbs of Damascus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're right um, in the sense that it is an Iranian boogeyman. How often they hit Iranian positions, because of course Iran is here with the permission of the Syrian government, it's a long standing ally. Mm -hmm. of Syria and it's here. All of these countries are here. I'm not saying that they don't have their own interests, but they're here basically because they can contain the terrorist threat inside Syria. Right. Russia can contain the Chechens, China can contain the Uyghurs, uh, Iran can contain you know, many of the terrorists that would pretty rapidly be heading back towards Iran if, if Syria were to fall to an Islamist regime, which of course would be um the kind of wet dream of the u.s coalition right yeah yeah and i just want to um interject that the last i read there are about twenty five thousand uyghurs from china who are fighting uh on the side of al-qaeda isis affiliated groups in syria so that's something that's never brought up uh mostly in and... Italy. well in fact they're all in Italy. Yeah. okay <laughs> Yeah, so I think that um, it's important to mention too that all of the countries that you just discussed were invited to be in Syria. Yeah, the United States exactly. was never invited to be in Syria. Um, I think that's something that people, especially in the United States, because you know we have this American exceptionalism and we have a mainstream media that is state run propaganda that you know misleads the public daily. Um, you know, <laughs> United States citizens don't recognize or understand or even know um, that we are there, um, you know, completely illegally. We are, it's an illegal occupation of a uh, you know of, of a foreign country I mean this and you know this is this is what we do all the time um, and so I think it's important that people recognize that we are we were never invited to be there um, you know Russia was invited Iran's been invited China's been invited we were not invited <laughs> ever ever to be there yeah, so, exactly um, and, and that's the point you know it's it's even if because Israel tends to put out this yeah we're hitting you know Iranian forces because we're preempting Iranian aggression against Israel, 
again, we're back to this preemptive strikes, right? As, um, as people like Soleimani are being assassinated, like that's yeah. not preemptive enough? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, but, the, the assassinations in Tehran um, mm -hmm. more recently. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. Israel, um, just like the United States, always positions itself in the spot of the defender as opposed to the offender. And I think if you look at the 10 or so years of the war on Syria that's been happening, uh, you see that very clearly. And um, I'm wondering what you think or what your opinion is on the U.S.'s and even Israel's end game in all of this, what, besides the oil, is it just the oil or is there something more strategic about it? Strategically advantage, advantageous to the U.S. and Israel. Um, <clears throat> I don't think you should take the U.K. out of the equation either. Oh, well, I won't. <laughs> you know, won't. The, <laughs> the U.K. is effectively, in my view and in the view of many analysts, totally in charge of the intelligence operations against Syria, without a doubt. Okay. America is the muscle. Yeah. Right. Always. Uh, and, and and Israel is the joint satellite state that they're they're protecting basically, and that they want to have uh, hegemony mm -hmm. in the regional supremacy in the region. Um, I think the end game. Um, there's a number of end games. The oil is largely irrelevant. The the only relevance of the oil is revenue for the U.S. proxies. So they don't have to pay them, <laughs> right? Mm. And preventing the oil from uh, coming into Syria, into the uh, government protected area of Syria, which is around 70% of Syria. That's the point of the oil, to deprive the Syrian people of electricity, of fuel, of uh, heating gas, or, you know, to make their lives as miserable as possible. That's why Israel and Trump were burning wheat fields deliberately, barley fields, cotton, um, whole areas of forestation were set on fire last year under, as they say, Trump's, you know, dying embers. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, he, he turned Syria into um, a furnace. And so that has meant food insecurity through the winter, which, of course, you know, they still keep trying to pin on the Syrian government. Right. The Syrian government is still providing free bread. Yeah, there are five hour queues for that bread, but it's still available, despite the fact that the Kurds are selling the wheat and barley. America destroyed the majority of the crops last year, so there wouldn't be enough for, for this year. They are bringing um, food in. I think India just provided um rice, um, Russia and Iran are doing their best, but of course they're also under heavy sanctions. Right. You know, people forget this. Lebanon has been deliberately pushed into economic freefall. The, the Beirut port explosion cuts off another lifeline to Syria. You know, I, I don't like to, to, to discount other countries, but right now it's all about Syria and under Biden, that's what we're going to see. And of course, everyone in the West is focused on coronavirus. Right. Nobody's looking at Syria. Nobody's looking at what Biden, they're all too worried about domestic policies, their health insurance, uh, what's going to happen to them. You right. Know? And Which, that's, and that's um, a, a real intentional thing yeah. that happens in this country. Um, you know, we, um, we're force fed um, propaganda from mainstream media. Um, and we know we're never shown um, the the ramifications of our foreign policy. Um, really since Vietnam, we don't see any of that um, in, in any real way. Um, and then we're force fed, you know, this American exceptionalism line of, you know, we're helping, it's humanitarian efforts, whatever. Um, and, you know, that's a, a real problem in this country. I mean, it's, it's this narrative control thing that's, that's going on. Um, but you mentioned sanctions, and I wanted to really touch on that because I don't think that people recognize um, how mm. devastating the, the Caesar Act sanctions have been on Syria. Um, you mm. know, this is a country that, like we've mentioned, is, you know, nine, ten years after a war is now being hit with unbelievably devastating sanctions. Um, and, you know, the, it's, it's 
um, it, it is it, it, what and you're right. It's 100 percent intentionally designed to devastate the country of Syria and the people of Syria so that the United States can then take over control and install a puppet dictator like we do everywhere else that we go. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the sanctions and the effect that they've had on the Syrian people? Uh, <laughs> they're devastating, basically. Yeah, no, that's, that's heavy. Uh, it's, I mean, um, they effectively, in a sense, um, they kill more people than a military war. <laughs> that's bottom mm. line. You know, yeah. in Iraq, how many hundred thousand kids died because of sanctions? Um, yeah. I'll but come but, back to but the it was, end it was game worth in a the, It was worth well, the price. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they are devastating. Um, I mean, I mentioned, because the thing is, it's not only about the sanctions. It's about the other measures, like the occupying of um, the oil resources, largely the occupation of water resources, right? The um, burning of crops, the burning of forests, the burning of um, fuel convoys, the burning of fuel depots, right? From the very beginning of this war, if you look at where the terrorists occupied first, they occupied resource rich regions, whether that was water, whether it was oil, whether it was electricity, another really important thing. You know, they, they've managed to destroy basically um, many of the electrical power stations here. Mm -hmm. um, and in Idlib, for example, Turkey is um, setting up power grids, which is then uh, supplied by Turkey. And I want to come back quickly at the end of sanctions to the to the end game and, and the dual, um, if you like, um, revenue source for Al Qaeda in the Northwest and ISIS and SDF in the Northeast, which kind of combines together as, a, as an oil industry. It's, mm -hmm. That's an important one because most people, when they hear about humanitarian aid, they don't really get what humanitarian aid means for Syrians, right? And this is a really important point to make. The humanitarian aid that Americans will hear about is coming exclusively into areas under the control of Al Qaeda, right? Last year, Kelly Croft, I think it was last year, um, the US ambassador to the UN came to the Babel Hawa crossing, which is on the border between Idlib and Turkey. Now, at this point, she was pushing for the reopening of cross-border humanitarian aid um, stations so aid could re-enter Syria. But what nobody ever hears is, no, the aid is only coming in to Idlib, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is controlled by Al-Qaeda. Brett McGurk, the biggest Al-Qaeda haven since 9-11. Now, Bab al Hawa, which is the crossing that she visited, and afterwards she said, oh, you know, this is, this is the humanitarian crossing in Syria. This one must be kept open. Well, why must it be kept open? Because it's Al-Qaeda's trading post. Mm. It's totally under control of Al-Qaeda. Everything that comes into Bab al Hawa <laughs> gives them revenue, right? Right. I, I mean, it's extraordinary. So this, I, I really want people to understand this. Oh, it's, does not it's, come into it's, Syria. It's it doesn't beyond come into... extraordinary. It's it's <laughs> insanity. Yeah, it really so, is. So aid is revenue for the armed groups, and I've been told today that they're even starting to set up cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and. Like, oh my know? god! I mean, we can't even get. We have rising inflation, right? Because. You know, nothing can get in, nothing can get out. Syrians can't get in, Syrians can't get out. Um, a lot of Syrians had their money in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that, that's kind of bye-bye now. Right. So, you know, and that was one of the reasons that Lebanon was targeted. Um, but there's also a crossover between Al-Qaeda in the Northwest and ISIS in the Northeast and the oil. Under Trump, uh, Delta Crescent uh, Energy was set up in February 2019 by a former U.S. ambassador to Denmark, uh, a former Delta Forces officer, and a former CEO of a British um, oil company. <laughs> and effectively, uh, that in collaboration um, with the Kurdish guerrillas was stealing 
Syrian oil and taking it uh, through the uh, border crossing near the Al Tanaf military base into uh, Iraq and Turkey for sale, right? Mm. But at the same time, Al Qaeda is processing the oil that the Kurds are stealing in the northeast. They're processing it in the northwest and selling it to Turkey under uh, another petroleum company called Watad. Now, Watad is under the control of HTS, which is Al Qaeda. And they have W A T A D. W A T A D? R A D for donkey. A D. Okay. (laughs) And effectively, Watad, so Al Qaeda, have a monopoly over um, the sale of or the oil revenue, the, the oil trading in Idlib. Now, so so they process the oil that is being stolen by ISIS and the Kurds in the Northeast under the, the control of the US, right? They're mm-hmm. processing that revenue. They're processing oil which comes in through Turkey from Ukraine. Now, of course, mm. we also all know about the US involvement in Ukraine. So oil is basically coming in from Ukraine through Turkey into Idlib, and it's then being traded by Watad. And I think there's one other um, petroleum company set up now, probably in competition um, with Al Qaeda. I'll find you the name for it. It escapes me immediately. So that's what I'm trying to say. You know, you really need to start understanding what humanitarian aid means when it's in a theater of military aggression being um, instigated by the US against a target country. It doesn't mean humanitarian aid. It's the same in Yemen. It doesn't mean humanitarian aid is actually being received by the people that need it. It means that the people who are trying to destabilize or dismember a country are receiving that aid. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, it's, just look at Libya as an example. Yeah, I mean that's that's kind of. I mean, we have uh, you know, thank you, Julian. We have an email from Nira Tandon where she's like, you know, we want to, um, you know, occupy and take over Libya. They have we can't we can't justify spending the money on it because people back at home will get mad. But they have oil, so why don't we go steal their oil so that we can fund the occupation and takeover of their country? And that's what we do everywhere. It has not, you know, it's it, that's kind of the the mo of the American empire. Well, yeah. I mean, even the SDR. I mean, Abdullah Ocalan, who was their leader, was imprisoned in Turkey with the help of the CIA in since 1999, right? If the Kurds cross from Syria into Turkey or into Iraq, they're terrorists. The U.S. put sanctions on Syria because they were harboring the PKK (laughs) as terrorists. (laughs) You know, this is the rank hypocrisy of the U.S. It's like one minute they're a terrorist, the next minute, oh, no, 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 you know, they're free fighting anarchist rebels. Right. (laughs) And they're useful to dismantling Syria. Yeah. You know, I mean, they've started, they've renamed areas of, of Syria. Uh, Kobani should be on al Arab. Rojava, I mean, Rojava doesn't exist in some, except in some kind of disillusioned cultish mind of the SDR. You know, the Kurds are, the percentage of Kurds in Syria is the smallest in the region. It's around, it's anything between 5 to 8% of Syrian population. <laughs> and of that percentage, actually, an even smaller percentage are actually looking for the autonomous region. They're effectively the PKK, mm-hmm. which, as I say, were declared a terrorist group by the US. Sanctions were put on Syria in the early 2000s, right, when they were actually courting Bashar al-Assad. That's another point that people forget is look at the um, George Bush, Tony Blair emails where they're actually talking about, let's try and do a different relationship with Syria, right? Um, these are all recorded in the Chilcot report after the weapons of mass destruction um, debacle in, in Iraq. Um, and so for a period of time, they courted Bashar al-Assad, but of course he wouldn't back down on his principles, which is the freedom of Palestine, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Anti-Zionism, uh, anti-imperialism, support for Hezbollah, they wouldn't kick Hezbollah out of Syria, 
Right. Because a lot of the Hezbollah, of course, grew out of the Palestinian refugees that fled yeah. into Syria and were given effectively citizen rights here. Yeah, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I feel like this is a no, good no, point no. To, to, to examine this topic a little bit more. But Hezbollah, like what has their or what has its role, for lack of a better word, been in Syria? Um, obviously, they're allied with uh, the Syrian government and um, <clears throat> Nasrallah has made very clear that they are allies of the Syrian government, but of course, we're constantly told that instead of being a part of the Lebanese government, um, they're a terrorist group, and so they're just dismissed outright. But I think they've been playing a more important role in Syria than than we've been we've been able to decipher from, especially mainstream media. So maybe you can explain that a bit. <clears throat> Um, Hezbollah has been uh, instrumental uh, in uh, the defense of uh, Syrian territory and particularly where they've been particularly um, strong is on the border between Syria and Lebanon. Now what a lot of people don't understand is in that area there are actually a number of Christian communities that were under threat from uh, the extremist armed groups. Um, for example, al Qaeda. I think it was in 2016, um, it received a number of suicide attacks from a refugee camp of extremist um, group members who had fled Syria and set up a refugee camp literally only a few hundred meters from the Christian town. Um, now, I visited al Qaeda. Um, and so I can say categorically that one of the main reasons uh, that that town survived is because Hezbollah was there to, to protect it and defend it, mm -hmm. right? And that's the same all along um, the, the border between Lebanon and Syria. So effectively, Hezbollah has been protecting um, the Lebanese and the Syrian Christian communities. And that is something, I mean, the... the the town of Malula, uh, where they still uh, teach Aramaic in the schools, mm. that was taken over by um, Nusra Front or Free Syrian Army, sort of increased by Nusra Front. I think it was for around um, four or five months. And Hezbollah, again, along with the local resistance fighters, the Christian resistance fighters, were and the Syrian Arab Army were instrumental in the liberation of that town. And you I, know, Hez, I, Hezbollah is, has effectively been in solidarity with the Syrian Arab Army in a number of um, battles for liberation. Not exclusively, you know, people might say, yeah, but you know, it's sectarian, they're only going to liberate um, the, the Shia areas, the, the Shia Muslim areas, that's their, their focus. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, pe people, uh, Americans especially, have such short historical memories. And if you go back to 2006, when Israel was trying to uh, essentially annihilate Lebanon, and Hezbollah essentially drove them out, um, one of the things Nasrallah was very clear about was that Hezbollah is not interested in invoking uh, Shia law. Um, it's, it, he was very clear about saying that whatever the Lebanese people decide, you know, whether Hezbollah is a majority or whether it's a minority, they support the Lebanese people and their self-determination. And that, you know, 2006, that was, it's almost going to be 15, it'll be 15 years this summer. And I'm sure that's totally forgotten by most people, most analysts, and um, definitely that amnesia skews the perception of Hezbollah and what it's doing in in Syria. Um, you know, never mind the fact that it's been invited there uh, by Syria, but uh, it's still looked at, um, I would say, almost the same way that Hamas is looked at. Uh, again, labeled as a terrorist organization and 
all of what they've done for uh, with regard to protecting their people and also fighting in solidarity with with allies, uh, you know, gets thrown out the window. And um, I think they're like one of the new boogeymen, like Hamas has been. And we heard when, uh, well, it's still ongoing, I think, but when the coup in Venezuela started that Hezbollah is in, is in Venezuela and it's possibly going to make its way up through Mexico and into the U.S., just this <laughs> utterly ridiculous, like there's some fantasist in the Pentagon writing this story out. And, and uh, they saw in his fantasist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're really but, creative, though. I mean, you have to give them I some know, credit. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of impressive, the stories that they're able to come up with and, and the fact that they're able to, um, you know, get people to believe it. And that's what's so fascinating to me about the United States populace is you know, it's not like we don't know that the, the government and the media lies to us constantly. We have a ton of historical references to examine on that. And yet people still just, um, you know, kind of blindly accept whatever we're told. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's kind of amazing. Like just from, I mean, it, it's it's depressing, but it's also extremely fascinating from like a psychological aspect of what that is. Um, yeah. But they are very good at the propaganda game, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I you know, Syria has had 10 years of propaganda war against her. Um, mm -hmm. And yet people completely forget, oh yeah, Iraq, weapons of mass destruction, Syria, chemical weapons attack. And even yeah. now that the OPCW is completely discredited, it's shown to have produced a false report um, to have effectively suppressed evidence from high level inspectors to have replaced the high level inspectors with a junior team in order to to kind of produce the report they really wanted which of course was to retrospectively justify the the us france and um uk aggression that came even before the opcw inspectors had made it into duma mm -hmm. right in 2018 um, and they forget about Libya, they forget about Iraq, they forget about the first Iraq, the, you know, the incubator babies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Nar they forget Naria. about the lace and, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, you know, people's memories, I, I don't know what happens to them. And it's like even now with coronavirus, I mean, do people really think that the same governments that have basically been genociding entire peoples on the other side of the world? give a shit about the little people in their own country. Right. You know, I, I mean, still, currently still, still to this day, we're poisoning the people of Flint and other cities across the country. Oh. Flint's not anywhere close to the only one, but they still don't have clean water in Flint. I mean, it's it's amazing to me that any American citizen can ever even fathom the idea that their government gives two shits about them. Mm. It's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's a disease. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, the division over Syria was extraordinary. I mean, for for 10 years, the, the, it's been completely down the middle, you know, and it still is, there's still divided opinion, even after all the evidence that has come out that this is another regime change war, that it is being backed by the US and its allies, that they are funding and financing and equipping the terrorist groups to overthrow a government that they don't like. You know, it's all out there. They pretty much all admitted it. But people yeah. are still sticking to the propaganda. Yeah. Well, that's well, kind of the best thing about Trump was that he just straight up admitted it. We're there to take their oil. <laughs> like, we're going to keep their oil. Like, he just he just said it out loud. I mean, that's really the uh, reason they got rid of him is because dude had no gift for subtlety. He had no talent <laughs> to know when to, like, shut up, stop talking. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was very blunt about the fact that, you know, yeah, we're there for their oil. Like, that's... I mean, that's why we're there. And it, that's kind of, that was, I mean, I can't stand Donald Trump, but it was a little bit refreshing for somebody to just <laughs> lay it out there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. This, why we're, this is why we're here. At least, kind of at least he knew what yeah. he was going to do when he bombed, <laughs> when he bombed Syria in 2018 after uh, the Duma hoax. At least he said he was going to bomb Syria. Not that that's a good thing, but you but knew what was going to happen. Not about it. 
Yeah. That's something I actually wanted to ask you about, because what I find um, extremely troubling, um, you know, given now we have a, a Joe Biden administration or regime or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, we it, during the Trump presidency, um, the Democrats consistently attacked him from the right on foreign policy. And that's really scary to me because, um, and, 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 you know, even like progressives, you know, quote unquote progressives were going along with this and, and you know, kind of. Uh, lambasting him for not being, you know, tough enough on Russia or strong enough on Syria or whatever, and like egging him on to be, you know, more brutal and bomb more. And, you know, it's, and, and you know, people are, are kind of um, uh, not grasping the fact that we have two, um, you know, neo, we don't even really have two, they're one party, but they have, you know, given us the illusion of two neocon parties mm -hmm. that are extremely um, aggressive on foreign policy. And it's, um, to me, that's really scary that that's the, the kind of position that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, maybe you can speak to that just from, you know, being in Syria and being kind of under um, the threat of that. Uh, what that, you know, what what does that look like to you? Because it's terrifying to me. Hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, from from Syria's perspective, um, I guess they haven't really seen a big difference <laughs> across the board. I mean, Obama <clears throat> was there to begin with. Um, the only the only wobble, I guess, Obama had um, was over the 2013 uh, Guta alleged chemical attack, mm -hmm. um, which again has also, you know, pretty much been discredited and disproven. Which was supposed um, to be the red line, right? Yeah. Mm. Or the and, line and he, in the sand. He, he backed off. He backed off on the red line, and of course, Biden, I think, has has made statements along the line, and certainly his administration have made statements along the line. Um, uh, who's the head of security? The name's just escaped me. William. Uh, you mean the Jake new one, Joe Biden? Jake no, Sullivan. The, the, <clears throat> or no, uh, the head of is it the head of CIA? Anyway. But a number of the uh, administration are basically saying, you know, their big regret is that Obama pulled back at that point and, and didn't basically go full on um, against the Syrian government, et cetera. Um, well, according to Cy Hirsch, he had Obama had doubts about yeah. the the uh, the veracity of the chemical attack claims, you know, that the attack actually happened. Um, mm -hmm. So, that hasn't stopped them before, though. Yeah. No. <laughs> but, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know what went on there, to be honest. But right. I think that you Obama know, it, made the mistake of asking. Like he, like normally they don't ask, but he was like, "Hey, should we, you know, uh, 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 retaliate for this chemical attack?" And people were like, "No, we're not doing that." And he was like, "Oh, okay," but he ended up doing it anyway. Um, you yeah. know. That's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, I think you're right. I, I think, look, I tend to look at it that the neocons are in charge and it doesn't really matter whether it's Labour in the UK, Conservative in the UK, Democrat or Republican in the US. It doesn't make any difference. It's the neocons, it's the globalists, it's the... Um, military adventurers, the military industrial complex, it's it's all of that that's involved and is in charge, the deep state, etc. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so the president and, and even the party is largely, I mean, Biden is, is kind of bipartisan neocon, right? I mean, he's got people on, on the so-called left and right on, on board with his policies, mm -hmm. particularly his foreign policies, right? Um, yeah. and, and he'll, his just administration, go, he'll just go wherever he's pushed yeah. at this point. Yeah, I did see a report the other day that they're probably going to bump him off somehow and bring yeah. Kamala Harris up pretty quickly because yeah. uh, he, sh he shouldn't speak publicly. No, <laughs> no. no. The, town, the town hall he had last <laughs> and week I think was... that they're very much trying to keep him hidden. I mean, if, you, if you've noticed, since he has taken office, he's done one town hall. Um, I think he's done one sit down interview. Um, he hasn't done any like there's a massive weather catastrophe going on in multiple states in the South. Yeah, and he hasn't really yeah. spoken publicly about it at all. It's kind of amazing yeah. that he's getting away yeah. with it. But people yeah. are willing to just give yeah. excuse it, you know, like, yeah, OK, it's, OK. It's, but are people oh, still it's pretty intense. They, 
are they still in the kind of well it's not trump yeah <laughs> because yeah. that's what i'm getting from all the kind of okay so i get i get at least it's not trump and i also get just given time he just took office um, which I find to be incredibly insulting because this is have? a guy who has 50 years, 50 years. Yeah, like he's exactly. been a piece of shit for 50 years. How much time? Nine eleven, Patriot you know? Act. I mean, how much more stuff do you want to yeah. drag up on him, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> give him time, Vanessa. He needs time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and, Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, he, he's he's just like the consummate opportunist careerist if you look back at his career he's done nothing positive literally nothing like everything that he's known for politically is negative and in some yeah. of the worst ways with regard to yeah. racism with regard to misogyny sexism yeah, exactly. um i believe tara yes. reed when she said she was raped by by biden um and all of that gets thrown out the window uh, you know, before he even comes into office, people throw it out the window and vote for him because at least it's not Trump. And that's, yeah. I, I don't, yeah. well, I don't want, I don't want to like collectively look down on people, but that's pretty fucking sad that that's the state we're in. And, um, and, you know, as we've been talking about Syria, it's obvious that it has, serious ramifications for not just the u.s but countries like syria and other countries where the u.s is um you know has sort of injected itself for uh yemen. geopolitical means yeah yemen um so one of the things i wanted to ask you about too vanessa is uh the golan heights which israel has illegally occupied since 1973 and recently they were somewhat named or completely named Trump Heights, uh, courtesy of Bibi. But is, Israel has Israel has claimed that it's officially annexed the Golan Heights, um, and that it's now part of, uh, yeah, that's Israel proper. So I'm wondering if you can speak about that a little bit because that's a not just an occupation, but also a, uh, a piece of Syrian territory, if you will, that is often forgotten about and not a lot of people talk about it. And it's a uh, it is a tinderbox of sorts. Yeah, I mean, it is. And, and you're right. I mean, I tend to look at it. Um, it's the whole map of Syria. And if we actually look at it, of course, you've got Israel in the south. You've got America in the Northeast, the American coalition. Uh, you've also got Turkey now in the Northeast, of course, annexing the buffer zone on the border. Um, you've got Turkey in the Northwest, and you have Lebanon now severely weakened. So you effectively have Syria, if you like, um, as, a, as a kind of insular state, right, surrounded on almost all sides with the one friendly border, if you like, although Jordan has um, uh, come a little way forward to um, kind of restoring economic um, trade and relations, etc. But, you know, Jordan is still not to be trusted. We're pretty sure that the weapons are coming into Rukban camp from Jordan, for example. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a British satellite state <laughs> still. Right. Um, and so the, the Golan Heights... Um, you know, people tend to say, yeah, well, you know, Assad forgot all about them and so on. No, they haven't. But, you know, Syria is waging a war right now on so many fronts. Right? Um, it can't, at this point in the proceedings, take on Israel. I mean, whenever Israel attacks, I always hear, you know, why doesn't Russia shoot back? Why doesn't Russia bring down any of their planes? Why doesn't, well, one, Russia would have to bring down their planes in Lebanese airspace mm -hmm. because they don't come into Syrian airspace. They fire from um, Tripoli usually or in, in Lebanese airspace, right? The missiles Illegal. that come into Illegally, Syria. we should. Yeah, of course, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, I know for a fact. Um, there have been times when even U.S. planes 
for example, US have, have effectively created a no-fly zone in the Northeast, protecting the Kurdish forces, by the way, in Hasaka. America will buzz Syrian Air Force planes out of that area, or certainly from 2016, that's what they would do. Um, but I know in, on certain occasions when Israel has crossed into Syrian airspace, Russian airplanes have, um, have buzzed them out mm -hmm. of the airspace. Right. So there's a lot of things that are not made public, partly because Israel doesn't want the public to know that that's happening. Right. Russia keeps pretty quiet on it because it doesn't want to fan the flames of war any further. You know, it's hard for people to understand the level to which Russia is trying to play mediator here. So while it's offering military support to Syria, and yes, of course, it's building its, its military base in the Middle East. Syria will be, if you like, almost a satellite state to Russia in the future. To some extent, it will still be an independent state. Um, uh, and it, at the same time, it's mediating with Israel. It's mediating with Turkey. It's mediating, you know, and 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 it's trying to maintain a sort of diplomatic, political um, part in this as well. It's, it's, it's walking a very difficult line. I'm not saying it doesn't make mistakes. I'm not saying it doesn't do things out of self-interest. I'm not saying that at all, but this is real politic. Mm -hmm. And Russia is a master at real politic, right? It's also yeah. one of the most patient nations on this yeah. planet. <laughs> Seems to be. I mean, honestly, you know, if we're talking about civilization, you know, Russian diplomats and, and ambassadors and politicians just show the Western lack of statesmen for what it is. I mean, yeah. no one can match. Sorry, I don't believe so. No one can match the Russians in the UN or in diplomatic circles. Yeah. And that's uh, one of the things I kept asking friends and family in the build up to the 2020 election is if Biden wins, can you imagine him in any capacity on the world stage with somebody like Putin? It's, no. it's like, oh. like the saddest comedy you can think of. Well, if you, I don't know if you guys saw just a couple of days ago, there was a, a, an a article talking about how uh, Kamala Harris is actually meeting with world leaders on behalf of Joe Biden. Oh. Um, you know, which is really not a surprise. Joe Biden is not president. Um, it's, not that, it's not that even Joe Biden isn't president, because like Vanessa has said multiple times already, it, it really doesn't matter who's president. It, it, that person is really just the face of the empire. It's the same policy. It's the same, you know, game plan. <laughs> Um, but he is really not even like president, like the figurehead. I mean, he's just like the face. He's the guy that had the name recognition that they could, you know, use to justify cheating Bernie Sanders yeah. again in the primary, um, you know, without it looking too bad. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, Steve Poikinen from Slow News Day calls it the Biden-Harris administration. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so, yeah. yeah. So She's actually doing the, the meeting with the world leaders. So, you know, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah. His, his, exactly. his sciatica can't take those long plane rides. So. <laughs> Grampy needs a nap. <laughs> oh, um, terrible. But can I just come back to the end game question? Yes, yeah, please. I didn't please completely answer that because it's quite complex. But I think basically now, and what we're going to see under Biden, is increased attempts to dismember Syria. So I think, you know, I've seen in the media, they're already starting to call the Northeast under the control of the Kurdish countries. They're starting to call it the autonomous region, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> you know, which is crazy when you consider the percentage of the Kurds versus the percentage of um, the Assyrians, the, the Arabs, and so on in this area. It's effectively ethnic cleansing that's going on, settling. Mm -hmm. uh, in in the image of the Israelis, of course, who support um, any form of Kurdistan. Right. Um, and uh, so we're looking at, I think, a dismemberment of Syria, a mm -hmm. chopping off of corners, a maintenance of the Golan Heights, as you mentioned, a creating of an autonomous region in uh, the northeast, 
which will also give Turkey the excuse to maintain the buffer zone to, to annex Syrian territory in order to create the buffer zone to protect it against the Kurdish autonomous region, right? And then in the Northwest offering, because I'm starting to see the kind of lexicon that, you know, the, what are they calling it? The Al-Qaeda government, the salvation government. You know, I, I don't know where they get who's, these names from. Who's, <laughs> who's, who's, who's calling wow. them that? The West, basically, you know, really? I mean, they're, they're claiming Asian they government? called themselves that. But, I mean, come on. Wow. <laughs> that that um, sort of has echoes of the um, the Algerian civil war in the early 90s yeah. when uh, I forget the entire name of the group, but I, I think it was calling itself like the Islamic Salvation Front. And, you know, this was a group that was going around slitting babies' throats. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good PR though. Yeah. Uh, Throw salvation yeah. in there. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, people in the West that are not really following Syria and don't really know the history and the context, they read something like that. Oh, great, the Salvation Government. You know, <laughs> right. they don't recognize that it's probably made up mostly of Al Qaeda who are slitting babies' throats and yeah. you know, conducting atrocities against civilians on a daily basis. Um, and running mafia operations, etc. But um, so, yeah, to dismember Syria, partition Syria, um, to maintain control of the resources, i.e., to weaken um, the state, right? To maintain and to double down on on any kind of economic pressure that they can. Um, to blockade and besiege. And that's why I'm saying to you, it's important to look at the bigger picture and to see the areas that are actually under occupation. So effectively, Syria doesn't have access to the majority of its borders, safe access, mm -hmm. right? Um, except Lebanon and Lebanon we know is, and I'll very quickly cover Lebanon. But effectively, it's to dampen down Iranian influence and Iranian road access through Syria, through Iraq, Syria, and towards Palestine. That's what mm -hmm. Israel wants. It, it wants Iran out of the region altogether, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, to effectively, I mean, they've started... Um, putting forward proposals to the Syrian government, which are equivalent to complete surrender and submission. Right? It's, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, it's all couched in, you know, well, if you do this, then we'll make these concessions and so on and so forth, right? And then, of course, America will, con will maintain control of its military bases. And from those military bases, ISIS will carry out random attacks um, on a regular basis. So they'll maintain the instability. It's, it's like a spoiler role. They'll maintain the instability. So if they can't get rid of President Assad and they can't defeat Russia, Iran, Hezbollah and Syria militarily, they will make sure they don't have victory. That's the important thing. Yeah. And then, of course, you get into the Chinese Five Seas project, you know, where, where Syria was the hub um, for that entire project, so they don't want that to happen because mm -hmm. they don't want a uh, Chinese uh, economic supremacy anywhere in the world. Um, I quickly wanted to touch on UK intelligence operations in Lebanon that have been recently um, exposed by Anon, who put out um, a series of UK Foreign Office document leaks, both relating to Syria and to Lebanon. And the UK Foreign Office has been involved in very similar infiltration um, programs via outreach agents um, and organizations in Lebanon. Some of them cross over with the same organizations that were working to infiltrate and destabilize and set up shadow states in um, various areas of Syria also. But basically, to really condense it down, they've infiltrated military security intelligence operations inside Lebanon and also high-level <clears throat> government officials. Um, now, recently they brought in um, a load of um, military trucks, which they are giving to the Lebanese army for um, defending the borders. Now, of course, we know that Hezbollah are responsible for defending the borders. So yeah. this is basically the Lebanese army is basically yeah. impotent. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's been very much like actually in Iraq. 
where the, the Iraqi army was very much empowered by Hashad al-Shabi, which is perceived as the Iranian proxy in Iraq. Of course, they're not their Iraqi militia, the PMU, the, the Popular Mobilization Unit or Forces, Hashad al-Shabi as it's called there, um, but who have been responsible for the defeat of ISIS, not the army. It was the PMU or Hashad that, that drove out ISIS. And then, of course, now, now very much like Hezbollah, they're kind of uniting more with the army and looking at um, entering the political arena. So mm -hmm. it's a very similar kind of genesis to, to Hezbollah in some ways, right. but again, perceived as an Iranian proxy in Iraq. So yeah. not liked by anyone in the U.S. coalition and the Israeli kind of It's axis. almost like any, any kind of, um, any kind of Arab self-determination now is <laughs> is iranian it's like nefarious iranian influence it's so ridiculous yeah. it gets applied course, to everything it, yeah and, and you know the british operations in lebanon of course is effectively to stir up unrest um so the whole color revolution thing again mm -hmm. um but also to provide a counter attack to hezbollah by reinforcing the Lebanese army, the intelligence and, and security forces there. And also they're targeting Tripoli, which is interesting because Tripoli <coughs> was originally um, going to be one of the main uh, ports that would be taking the oil um, from Homs in Syria. And that was the Qatari pipeline that of course Assad refused. Mm -hmm. right? Because right. he favored the Iranian um, Russian backed pipeline. America wanted him to to take the the proposal of the Qatari um, Turkish pipeline, which would have run through Homs. And Homs is oil rich um, and also rich in hydrocarbons. And of course, that was one of the first areas occupied by the terrorist groups. Tripoli in Lebanon was going to be the port from which the Homs resources would be taken to Tripoli to then be sent into Europe. So I kind of find it quite interesting that the British now are trying to increase their influence in Tripoli <laughs> yeah. right, through the military intelligence and security agencies in Lebanon, again, as, as a counterbalance to Hezbollah or as an attack on Hezbollah, basically, mm -hmm. from within the British embassy. All of these operations were run by the British Embassy. I have to say, after the first leak, the British ambassador resigned almost immediately on for personal reasons and <laughs> came back to the UK. But I'm sure it had nothing to do with the right? document. Yeah. Totally, totally <laughs> unrelated. Totally, 100%. Um, okay, so you've been very generous with your time. I know it's late there, and I know you have limited yeah, electricity. Sorry. I don't want to keep you for too much longer. Um, but one of my good friends, I you know, put it out on Twitter that we were going to be talking to you because I wanted to see if there was anything that anybody um, you know, had questions on or whatever. And my favorite question, just because I often wonder it too, um, came from my good friend Curry. Um, and he was just wondering, um, you know, about your security, um, being in Syria and, um, you know, reporting on these things. And we've seen, you know, the BBC has attacked you um, quite heavily and, you know, your Wikipedia page is ridiculous. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, did you write so, that yourself? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's kind of insane how um, blatant it is. Um, but yeah, like just, I mean, it, um, you know, being in Syria and, and reporting on the things that you do, um, you know, just because I adore you, um, you know, do you feel like you're, uh, you know, in a fairly safe situation, um, you know, just being, a, you know, being who you are, doing what you do? Um, <clears throat> I actually have to say I probably feel a lot safer here than I do when I'm doing talks in London or Canada or any of those places that are overrun by kind of Muslim Brotherhood extremist types that storm the talks or, or I don't know, carry out. No, I've actually felt a lot more threatened in the UK than I do here. Even at the height of the battles for liberation here, and I, you know, I, I always try to make this point. I don't think at any point, even, <clears throat> and Eva Bartlett, uh, my very dear friend, who's also been Love on a lot her. of the front lines, here in Syria, we both say the same thing. Even when the shells were falling, and even, you know, even when you're physically in danger, I never felt in danger because to be honest, the Syrian army takes such good care 
of journalists there. And actually, that includes the BBC, Channel 4, CNN, if they come in legally, of course, and if they come, you know, and, and don't come in with their Al-Qaeda escorts in Idlib, but if they come legally into Syria, they're taken care of like you would not believe. And, and this actually makes me so angry sometimes because they come to Syria the Syrian Arab army soldiers will put their bodies between that journalist and the snipers or that journalist and the rocket attack, right? But those journalists will leave Syria and then completely um, misrepresent the Syrian Arab army mm. because that's what they're being paid to do. That guy yeah. probably saved their life mm -hmm. and that's how they repay it. You know, it, it makes me so, it makes my blood boil actually. But no, I don't, I, I feel a lot safer here than I do back in the civilized world. <laughs> yeah, that's really something to hear you say that to say that, you know, in, in Syria, in Damascus, you know, which is, you know, under heavy attack and has been at war that you feel safer there than you do in UK. <laughs> well, I mean, I remember being here when America, France and the UK bombed after doing one. And I remember, I mean, it was crazy. There were missiles coming in that you wouldn't believe. It was like raining missiles. That was, that was actually um, the it night of my, my birthday. And I, was, <laughs> I, I spent the night of my birthday lying in bed listening to Mad Dog Mattis justify the, the oh. illegal bombing of Syria. <laughs> but the air defense took everything out almost everything and mm -hmm. i remember syrians being on the roofs of their houses in damascus cheering yeah right so you know these guys have been fighting the war for 10 years the syrian people have been fighting that war because the syrian army is the syrian people um and here if my car breaks down i'll have 10 people in 10 seconds to come and help me push it or start it or <laughs> give me benzene fuel. You know, I, I don't ever feel unsafe here. I, I don't remember a time when I have felt unsafe here, even as I say, under attack, because I feel that whether it's the Christian, Nash, Syrian Christian <clears throat> National Defense or the Syrian Arab Army, I just felt taken care of. I don't have that feeling in my country or as I say when I was doing a speaking tour in Canada I'm safer here well that's um I'm actually glad to hear that because um you do <laughs> incredibly important work um and you know I um am grateful to you for doing what you do and Eva as well I love Eva she's yeah. amazing you're both amazing um you're doing really important work um so uh do you want to tell everybody where they can find you so that they can follow um, you so that they can keep track of what's happening in Syria because I think you're right um, people are not paying enough attention to what's happening in Syria and uh, they need yeah. to be so tell everybody where they can follow you so that they can do that um, they can follow me on my patreon Vanessa Bede. I'm actually kind of in the process of swapping over because YouTube I'm on my second strike I'm on my third ban or suspension on Twitter so I'm kind of you know, <laughs> on the way out. So I'm on Rockfin. I need to really update it. Um, I'm going to be writing more, hopefully, for Whitney at Unlimited Hangout. Um, <clears throat> uh, my blog is The Wool Will Fall. Uh, uh, Last American Vagabond, of course. Uh, Slow News Day. Um, that's it. And that's Russia great. Today. I do write op-eds for Russia Today. <laughs> Everybody should definitely be checking out Rockfin. Um, it's not a perfect platform, um, but there's no censorship. So yeah, definitely yeah, follow exactly. the facts there. Um, and Unlimited Hangout, if you're not following Unlimited Hangout, what the hell are you doing with your life? You should be doing that. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, I, I appreciate you taking um, so much time to speak with us. Um, I would love to have you back on. There's, I mean, seriously, there's there's so many things that we could talk about regarding Syria. It's, you know, just a clusterfuck. Um, so um, anytime yeah. you want to come back, we are happy to have you on. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who's watching. And we will catch you next time. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thanks.